Yeah, and I'm going to try and keep it as light-hearted and, and relatively short, and I feel like I should defend myself. So, you know, <laughs> uh, when, uh, when the stroke uh, thrombolysis works too well and they end up with a hematoma or a natural stroke, we bail them out and do the craniectomy, right? Or neuroradiologists are overrated. We look at a lot of scans, but if we get stuck, we help them. No. In all honesty, um, I think um, why neurosurgery is probably quite suitable from that point of view. But we work, we work together and we're very intertwined all of this and I think in terms of neuroscience if you if that's what you want to do you just have to find your personality for whatever is it is suiting you um, so we're dependent on each other we help out and, and even if we have a bit of a battle kind of thing all right nonetheless uh, very briefly I'm Anne Azuz uh, I'm one of the uh, West Midlands neurosurgical trainees and I'm uh, coming towards the end which is a bit scary ST6 um, and I'm actually from Sweden I've been in England for 10 years it is now. Um, so I went to medical school in Uppsala, uh, Uppsala University in Sweden and then uh, before that went to a school where uh, quite a lot of my friends from there moved to London so I thought I'll give it a go and see what England's like. Um, did uh, an elective at King's in uh, London and then came across and applied for my F1, F2. I ended up in the East of England Deanery and I spent two years in King's Lynn in Norfolk, if anyone knows where that is, um, which was a very nice uh, small DGH and their introduction to the to sort of British way of um, working. Um, I applied to neurosurgery and I told uh, some of you that, uh, that people were telling me, oh, you need to you know, apply for orthopaedics and do general surgery. And, if, and I said, I, that, no, that's, I, this is what I want to do. Um, and I went ahead and I got to reserve for the interviews. So I didn't get through to interviews the first time around and uh, needed to put maybe a little bit more on my CV. So I did a LAS uh, intentionally so I could apply for an ST1 because there are all these rules in terms of how much neurosurgery you can do before you apply. And um, I ended up in Romford in London, which was really good reapplied and got to interviews and somehow ended up with a training number and uh, as a trainee in West Midlands. So, sorry, I think many of us don't know what last is. Oh, sorry, it's, it's, um, it's like a, a, a service provision. So you have various pathways so that the, um, the, the main aim is sort of to get as to become a trainee. So you get on to the run through program, right? Um, so the, it, you, there's not enough numbers to fill it up, so but there's still doctors required because we've gone from a system where you used to be an SHO and like you said, you move, move around from different specialties. So if you wanted to neurosurgery, you would do six months uh, neurology, six months ITU, six months ENT, and you would gather it all together and then you would get a number. And I'm not really sure how that was sort of worked out, but now it is one sort of national application and you get on and become a, a trainee or not but to fill the gaps there's something called an FTSTA or a LAS or a LAT um, and these are kind of training numbers but they're only a year at the time so I'm not going to go into the various because there's too many abbreviations right um, but it is a way to, to see if it's really what you want to do you, you, you get the flavour for it because I was more or less treated as a first year neurosurgical trainee in London being outside of the whole training scheme but still doing neurosurgery if that makes sense so um, yeah Does that, yeah uh, feel free because like I said I'm, um, I'm trying to keep a relatively loud answer so just ask questions um, my first contact actually with neurosurgery was when I was equivalent in high school. This guy, uh, Dr. Ben Carlson, he's an American neurosurgeon, as you can see him by the flag. Um, he came, and it was just actually after he separated the craniophagus twin, so com conjoined by the, by the cranium, two separate brains, right? But, um, and he went on a world tour, more or less, and, and had his presentations, and he came to Stockholm, the capital of Sweden and awed us all with his present performance and he was he was very um, he was very good and very sort of enthusiastic about it and I thought oh that's that's pretty cool um, and then I went through medical school and like I said to you guys I thought I was going to do neurology to start because it's a bit of a logic map you read and you, you a bit of a detective work right and then went through and did my surgical training placement and just love working with the hands 
Now, everyone doesn't go on to uh, become a presidential candidate. He works for within the Trump administration now, I think, so we'll skip that one. Right. <clears throat> so I'm not going to bore you with, with history, but just it's been around. So it, it, this video, if it works, it's not exactly rocket science because it's just a hole in the head, right? And uh, pretty much 7,000 7, years ago uh, is, I think, the late sort of backtrack to where they found uh, cranial skull uh, skulls that are actually healed up, meaning that about, or healing towards healing, meaning that the patient did survive these sort of um, interesting uh, uh, burr holes with uh, in uh, a treatment of passage of spirits, as you see, or treat pain or seizures or migraines or mental health disorders. Right? Um, that's obviously not any indication today. Then, very briefly, um, mm -hmm. Harvey Cushing was the first uh, exclusive neurosurgeon, if you like, obviously, the uh, first patient, uh, person to describe uh, you know, what we know as Cushing's disease. He uh, had a, a huge impact in terms of the survival, especially following different tumor surgeries, so bringing neurosurgery forward. Um, lifespan, I think it's 1869 to 1939, right, so covering the First World War. He also used um, uh, radiographs or x-rays to, to do certain diagnosis <laughs> not entirely sure how, but on calcification possibly. And he also used some electrical stimuli to, to have a look at the sensory cortex. So here you've got uh, neurophysiology, you've got neuroradiology, you've got neurology, right? So it's all from the beginning. Um, further on, I've just mentioned um, Yasuga, he's uh, born 1925, still alive, founder of microneurosurgery, so two sort of foundations of, from what we're doing today. Um, and he's Turkish, uh, written and spoke. So modern take on neurosurgery. Mm, you all know Dr. Shepard and, and Dr. Gray's anatomy. I'm not entirely sure, well, Monroe, obviously, but there are also two neurosurgeons. Not really quite what it's like, okay? Um, real life neurosurgery, I think it's a little bit like it's already been pointed out. You, you probably know or have a very good idea of if you want to do it and you should walk into it with with open eyes and realize what it is um, and doing this I had to sit down and have a little think and I put down these words um, where it is exciting right and it's a benefit of you never know what's coming through the door and right? you have a damn a day planned out and and most of the time it never turns out the way it's supposed to be um, which I enjoy right because it, it's it gives you the adrenaline rush right you have this major trauma coming in you're an A&E and there's a huge head injury and you get to take them to theater and you're the one pulling all the strings and making sure it happens and and you get to do the surgery and it is or a really nice tumor case or if you're into spine then it is there's everything and those are the highs you live on right so that's for, for your benefit if you make sense but then it's a huge privilege okay because you are literally you've got people's lives in your hands and it, it, it applies to quite a lot of specialties right but it is a, a touch and go or life and death with a stroke equally people come in and it's down to you to make sure that you're feeling well enough, you've eaten well enough, you've slept well enough to be there to, to look after them, okay? It can be demanding, or it is demanding, I should say. Um, it's relatively long hours. And you don't walk up and leave in the middle of a surgery. We had, um, I was in scrub with my consultant and the anaesthetist was there with his consultant. Come five o'clock, the reg said, right, it's my time to go home, I've, uh, working directives. And the consultant the anaesthetist said, yeah, yeah, no, that's fine, good, thanks for today, you've done a good job, and he was on call, right? So I turned around to my consultant and said, right, it's time for me to go home, and he just laughed. It's, it, <laughs> it's not really quite, you know, the, but, but it, it is a pleasure. So it comes with certain sacrifices, and, and coming with the fact that you don't know what's on the, the table, you can also end up having to cancel dinners or social engagements or it, 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 you have to be prepared to to give a little bit okay but the flip side is that it's extremely rewarding okay it sounds also like a bit of a cliche but having a thank you from a patient I got a teddy bear with a knitted sweater saying thank you Anne right that sits on my <laughs> on my desk and 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 those things drives you in a way and when things are really rubbish and you're just 
up to here with stuff to do. You can you can go back to these things and think, oh, actually, you know, it's not that bad. So a normal week, I put it in um, not brackets, but um, it's it's very thrown, and it, it depends on as a registrar, it depends on what's on your rotor. So next week I have a week of nights. So I come in do Monday to Friday night, um, and on that anything can come through the door as on calls. Um, surgery is obviously a, a current theme. You go to theatre with your <coughs> consultant, depending on what days to have surgery, and then obviously placed in other lists as well. Um, we do weekends, we do nights, we do late evenings, even when you have a normal day, we probably do evenings anyway. Um, we do have clinics because we need to see our patients before we operate on them. And if you can't, it's, it's maybe something we don't enjoy all that much, but equally if you can't see a patient and make a decision in clinic, you can never become a good surgeon because you need to know what to operate on and what not to operate on. Okay. Admin is something that's just on there. Otherwise, it's quite similar. It links in with, a <laughs> with what Dr. Matha said. We have um, MDTs, obviously, neuro-oncology, spinal MDT, all these kind of things that are very important to make a joint decision for the patient's best interest. Okay. Just as an example, theatre today, usually we start at 8, right? but you have to probably be in by 7 because you, you want the theatre to run at a reasonable time or at least not be blamed when it's a late start. So you come in and you consent your patients going through with it with your consultant the day before what you're going to do. If you have time, you go to the handover meeting, so taking in what's on call uh, have come in or what's been discussed overnight. Um, team brief for theatres to make sure that theatre staff knows what you're doing and what instruments and equipment you need and um, then depending on what kind of theatre there's either three or four cases after every case you do an operation note so you can give specific instructions and uh, always see the patient obviously in recovery and as opposed to other specialties I guess we, we're always keen for them to wake up and uh, they don't always do that and then you go home between anything 6 to 8 o'clock, or depending when things they yeah, finish. Um, so in terms of, there are obviously various types of subspecialties. I think I'm just going to run through things that will come in from our own call. And feel free to ask whatever questions. You've already seen a picture of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, you've got, I think this was actually a PCOM, but you've got the circular villa is quite heavy blood load. It looks like an MCA actually, but um, typical presentation with a thundercap, headache, you've got a, a World Federation of Neurosurgical Society grade, all right, grade one is a good one, grade five is a really poor one, um, and it is a neurosurgical emergency, and we do have help from our neuroradiology co uh, colleagues with a, with a coiling, but it's also possible to, if there's a big clot sitting here, and actually I think she did have a clipping in, uh, yeah, a clipping in the end, because um, if it's an associated big clot, then you're better off actually ruining the skull and taking the clot out, right, and putting a clip on that, but unfortunately it's a dying specialty but with vascular neurosurgeons, because um, there's the, the, our radiology colleagues are all that very good at um, coiling it, so um, we're not needed as much from that point of view. And then to, keeping out for um, hydrocephalus, vasospasm, rebleed, these are three sort of com um, complications from the subarach. And a little bit of imaging, so this is the same patient actually, you can see that, so this artifact here, so actually I'll point out, that's the aneurysm, that little blob sitting there, right, so you've got the, uh, uh, I've spun that around, yeah, I think that's the ACOM there, you've got a, a, the anterior cerebral there, um, and uh, PCOMs, and then the ICA there, um, nonetheless, that's the artifact given by the, by the, I think this might have been coiled, but then we intervened anyway, and we didn't touch the clot, but we took a bit of bone off here to give the brain space to swell so as to provide, pre prevent her from coning and a certain death. And that little <laughs> bit there is an ICP monitor, so we like putting those in um, to make sure we've got an, a reasonable idea of the pressure. Acute subdural hematoma, okay, that might not be the best scan in the world, but I remember this guy because um, he, uh, he was an alcoholic, he had, he was walking around um, and 
he was found walking around but he's probably had his head injury a few days earlier because you can see all this here um, was probably a bit more bright white you've got these bright white streaks here which indicates the acute blood and he's probably had a big clot here that settled down okay but he's got midline shift you can see this whole brain side is pushed towards the, the right side um and um he was not in the, the, obviously the Kelly Monroe doctrine. He's he's probably been sitting a little bit here for a few days, and then he's he's at the point where he's not being he's not able to compensate. So um, I took off half of his skull. It doesn't look much there, but you can see this this big flap here is taken out and put his abdomen or thrown away, depending on who who the consultant is on call, just to to give him a bit of space and um, have a chance of surviving, likely kept asleep for, for a good few days in ITU, just to, to let him recover. Extradural hematoma, another uh, emergency, and this is the lucid interval, so they, when someone gets hit on the head, they pass out, wake up, and reasonably okay, and then just go. So first one to the primary insult, second passing out because of the hematoma getting bigger. So, um, we tend to put the bone flat back, so I just went in, opened up here, took that out, didn't really go into the brain, and just put that flat back, kept him asleep for a little bit, and then actually woke up quite well. Um, there was talk about radiological diagnosis here, but chordoquina, I, I think, is more of a clinical diagnosis than actual radiological. Um, you can see spine here between the fifth lumbar, so L5, S1, you've got a very big disc pushing onto nerve roots, right? This is a scary scan. But equally, I've seen patients with this, this kind of picture not having that much of a neurological symptom. But if this is associated with weakness or cell anesthesia, urinary incontinence, bowel incontinence, and painless retention rather, they need to come in and they need surgery within 24 hours, preferably, okay? Other things, spinal fractures. It is actually a relatively heavy spinal workload, I think, within neurosurgery, on call in particular. Um, these two, uh, this is the same patient, but that's not necessarily his injuries. He's probably got fractures all the way through the spine and, and thoracic fractures, but this is a more likely an elderly gentleman. You can see the, the C-spine, and then it's a nice little gap there. And you, it's highlighted here, that white bit there means that the whole ligament in the front of the spine has just opened up. So he's probably fallen over and thrown his head back. In, and uh, if he's on a, a particular sort of MRI scan, he would have quite high signal, meaning it's, quite, it, it's a very unstable C-spine, okay? Um, point with polytrauma is that we get involved obviously from the head and the spine point of view but it's really important remembering that it's the whole patient right these guys come in and they've got hemoneumothoraxes she, uh, fractured pelvis long bone fractures um, everything with the butt pressure is down in the boot so it needs again teamwork from all all specialties I know even neurosurgeons but lone, lone wolves but we we do work in in teams um, other things, metastatic cord compressions. You, this is a, a particularly horrid picture, and I actually had to um, borrow this one from, from the good World Wide Web, I was about to say, um, which likely has been uh, metastatic involvement in, and then uh, just a, a fracture by dislocation, obviously, and unlikely any function whatsoever from, from this level and below. <laughs> Highly unstable. Um, and what's important from our point of view in this is it's easy to look at the scan and think, oh, you need to you need to do surgery. But you also need to know what's the prognosis for the patient. What is the primary tumor? Is this something that's beneficial for the patient? Right? Do we want to go in and do a massive fixation with with screws and rods and someone who's got three months to live? No, it's not. You know, you need to try and look at the patient's best interest and and see and that comes back to, you know, in when to operate them or not to. Brain tumours, obviously quite a, a heavy load from, from our side. Um, basics in terms of, is it a primary uh, high-grade, low-grade glioma? Is it a secondary? Where is the secondary? And again, what's the prognosis? Um, benign or malignant, is it a meningioma or any of, of the others? And surgical, non-surgical, and this way, where the MDTs come in. Right. We need to, to have help from, from specialties and come, come up with a joint decision, what's the best 
outcome for the for the patient. So if this is something that you still think you, you want to think about, um, the neurosurgical pathway, and I think it's it's similar to, like I said, it's a national selection. It happens once a year, and it, it is this um, Oriel, um, now it is Oriel online uh, applications, and you fill in, I think when I did it, it was about 10 or 12 pages. Um, and it's a run through. So once you're in, you're in, okay, ST1 to ST8. You have to do the MRCS, which is covering every surgical specialty, as I'm sure you know, um, and to, to be able to progress on to ST3. So if you haven't got it before you apply, you need to make sure that before, in your first and second year of neurosurgery, you do the MRCS um, and you become a Mr. or a Miss, right? Um, just to highlight the fact that we're not physicians. <laughs> um, but uh, and then we do our FRCS, so for neurological science, uh, neurological surgery at, after ST6. So I'll probably be doing mine in January next year. And SBNS, Society of British Neurosurgeons, right, have meetings uh, every six months, and their web page is actually really quite good in terms of looking into. They have a specific section uh, of what to do and, and what pathway to take if you want to do neurosurgery. And how to get an interview, or you know, it's it, it's it's pretty basic in terms of what's been mentioned before as well. You show an interest, right? Audits or research or projects. You try and get hold of the specialty that you you want. And I know we maybe sometimes a bit difficult, right? But um, we're not completely impossible. Uh, a taste a day or a week, just to to get an idea of what what it actually is. Um, Presenting at the SBNS is always a good good way of, of seeing various different people and, and talking to them and um, even if it's it's completely anonymous or is a national selection it's always nice to have a chat to people around the country because it's it's as much as we we submit our presentations and, and these bits and bobs it's very much a social event and, and catching up and then I think I put want trainable doctors and looking for future colleagues because this is what someone told me before I did my interview. And it is really basic, isn't it? It's just you, you look and see, is this someone that I want to work with and that makes you more keen to, to teach and, and um, it comes with if you show an interest and if you have you know genuine things in, in your logbook, then that's a given. All right. um, if you want to do a bit of reading outside of it, Mr. Henry Marsh, some of you might know him, he's, um, I think he was at George's in London up until only a few years ago. He's written, he's been in frequent in media as well, but I, I've read this one, I haven't read this one yet, but it's actually not bad. And even if you don't, you know, really want to do neurosurgery, it gives, he's very honest and open. And I promise I'm not taking any commission, right? but it's quite good. Right, um, then I put a picture of uh, me and my, my colleagues just to highlight that is, is you, spend an, you spend a lot of time together and you, um, you get to see each other at, at your worst, really, <laughs> as you do the, the long hours, the nights and the holidays and, and, um, and you, you form a quite a, a tight band with them. And, and um, it's, it's really nice because even if years passes by, then you still you know, catch up and, and, and good friends. Uh, then I'm not sure, this is just uh, for fun, right, you guys uh, might have seen this, can I click there? Um, and you have to, uh, it might be how some people see neurosurgeons. I think you might need to click escape. Escape. Uh, that's not the one. Oh, hang on, it's waiting. Uh, enable, we'll enable it. <laughs> Ooh, maybe not. An error occurred. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to do anything with that, I don't think. Nonetheless, it's um, it's a silly one, really. He uh, He's a guy who just... Um, Maybe you can try again, because I think it's silly. <laughs> and otherwise, we'll definitely post the slides. Yeah. Um, he's just being a bit of a uh, an idiot at a drink party, and he meets a rocket scientist at the end of it. So sorry, I've ruined it now. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, that's it. And I put this. This is actually from um, being a Swede. I was on skis when I was four, right? So it's just to highlight that. It, 
it's it's a lot of hard work and um, uh, some people literally live and breathe in your surgery but I think it's really important that you have a life outside as well so you, you get a bit of a break and you have somewhere to vent okay so that's it <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Can I ask to what extent is your uh, work split between kind of acute trauma patients and uh, the more planned like tumor So you have you specialize? Yeah. Um, you do have uh, trauma as um, as a specialty, so when you're a surgical. But I think as a as a registrar, that's when you obviously become more independent. You on your own course, you get all the traumas. Right. So you, you do the acute subdural, extra dural, um, sometimes cordial quine, and all these kind of bits. But then most units have uh, an allocation, so you're working with a consultant, which means that you are in their elective planned list on, on a normal day. Right. So you do get a little bit of everything, but it's more likely in terms of the amount of surgery you'll do will be limited until you get more senior, because obviously an elective case should not how many flaws, not that I'm saying that the emergency ones will do, but it, it's a completely different, you could argue that some, some of these, so like I said, I didn't even touch the brain on that, where you just, you just do the actual plain simple surgery, take the, the lid off and, and make sure that you don't do any harm, right? Whereas elective surgery can be anything from skull base to, uh, to Chiari malformations to positive. So the more senior you get, the more of the actual surgery you will do, but you'll be exposed to it throughout your training. Yeah. Uh, just to follow up with regards to the sub specializations, I've done up to your eight years and you have opportunities like within the eight years. Yeah, so you will, you have to, um, so you'll become familiar with something called ISCP. So you go through uh, every year, you go to your ARCP, which is a panel of consultant neurosurgeons that uh, look at you and go through every every move you've made uh, during the last year in terms of presentations, publications, numbers of surgery, and, uh, numbers of operations, um, work-based assessments and all these kind of things. Right? So you have to fulfill a certain amount of number of surgeries and within all the widespread from pediatrics to adults and, and all the specialties. The way it is today, you get your, when you do your exam, and hopefully pass, <laughs> you um, uh, move on to aiming to get your CCT, so core completion of core training. Right? After that, you tend to do a fellowship, or maybe even two, because um, it's not, I can't say I'm looking forward to getting to that point, because it's not all that easy getting a, a consultant job. All right. And especially if you have a, a certain specialist interest, you need to be a bit more flexible to where you want to go. Right? So it's it's more the fellowships that will mould you. Then you can obviously see, strive towards uh, what you want to do during your training if you know that early on. Yeah. With uh, interventional radiologists doing more, uh, has that affected your workload quite a lot? And is that viewed as a positive thing for the subcutaneous sort of cell? Um, I think from from our point of view, what it's done is that less people are going into neurovascular neurosurgery. Right. There are very few consultants who actually still um, do clippings. Right. I was talking to one of my senior, what senior, oh, it's a staff base, but also consultants saying that my time, you know, we have to have 20 clippings. I've maybe been present at three. <laughs> so so it's, it all depends on where you are as well. And I think in, in America, there's more clippings. In, in the UK, it's very much a coiling neurointerventionist uh, part. So I think what it's done is sort of balanced. There's not many neurosurgeons who would do the, the uh, coiling. Right? I know a few, but not many. Does that present a problem? Then? Are there some cases that need, you know, need to be clipped? I mean, there isn't as enough, you know, enough yep. people having done it. You know, will, will the hospitals be able to offer that? No. <coughs> no. Um, and there are sometimes uh, coilings do fail. Okay, aneurysms have a, a huge different morphology. So if you if you've got something that's a very wide neck in an awkward place, a coiling is not necessarily the best thing because you can probably do it with flow diverters and it's 
various they have various techniques obviously for it but but sometimes it is uh, eclipping or if there's a, a, an a inadvertent perforation right and and there's a big clot and then you need to take them straight from coiling to theater um and what we can do is make sure the clot isn't there but it's not 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 everyone uh, is happy to to open someone up and, and put a clip on unfortunately yeah i was wondering what sort of things do you um, so I think I'm a bit of an anomaly <laughs> because um, I didn't in terms of I knew I knew what I wanted to do so I think in terms of the CV I can tell you I, I tried to get like I said um, I had uh, various different audits and, and projects. I did my elective during medical school. I was eight weeks at King's in London. Um, I still, when I see some of those consultants, they still remember and say, oh, you, you know, you're a trainee and it's, so um, you, you link up a little bit also and people will guide you through if you can get in, in touch and, and just have a bit of a try and see, see what, what's um, the best thing to do. But in terms of interviews, I think you, you do best by, being who you are in a way and that sounds very uh, dull but it, it's not um they're not all that many posts around um in the uk and um i think comparing it to to friends who did general surgery and orthopedics it, it was more sort of a streamlined in a streamlined interview if that makes sense so a friend of mine who he, he went through and he's really good and and he prepared himself and he did it in in a very structured way and second time round he was a bit more personal if that makes sense so it's it's hard to explain because i know there's also a lot of tick boxes to do but i literally just walked in there and i could tell you a story about my interview morning and you wouldn't believe me right um but um, but I thought this is what I want to do, and and hopefully it will shine through. And if you have the interest and, and the keenness, it will it will be seen. And you, they're looking for trainable people. You know the, that's why there's a limit to I think 18 months of neurosurgery. If you've done more than that, I don't think you're eligible to apply for SC1. So there's a balance, obviously, and I, I know I was up against people with theses and PhDs and written books, and, and I sat there and I thought, Ugh. Um, but so this, and there's also, you need, you need a good mix, right? So there needs to be a little bit of everyone to, to balance things out, because there's not, there's no um, homogeneity at, at all <laughs> in our unit. There's one more question. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. If you specialise in certain aspects of neurosurgery, yep. does that mean you can only be part of that in terms of general neurosurgery? So general neurosurgeons are pretty much disappearing, okay, because there's such a sub-specialised area. Um, so I think Coventry, they're a little bit more general because they do both spine and cranial. The QE in uh, Queen Elizabeth in Birmingham, you're either a spinal or a cranial neurosurgeon. And uh, then you're either a, a instrumented, as in f fixation with the screws and the rods, spinal surgeon, or not so much, and more tumours. Or you are a CSF specialist, or you're a neuro-oncologist, and if you don't attend a neuro-oncology MDT, you shouldn't have the right to do a, a, a tumour if it comes in, right? And there's always, you know, there's always excuses in a, uh, if someone comes in with a massive tumour <laughs> to the brink of, of not surviving, of course, you, you'll do the craniotomy, right? But it's becoming more and more sub-specialised, and you stick to your end, which is why probably it's becoming a bit more difficult finding jobs, because... There might be a, a CSF trauma job, whereas you want to do skull base, and then that doesn't merge up. So, increasingly more.